All right, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Berman, and I'm the Senior Advisor of Strategic Partnerships for NYSERDA. I'll be your event MC and would like to welcome you to today's webinar on NYSERDA's Energy Efficient Indoor Air Quality Studies, uh, the overall results. This event is being collaboratively brought to you by the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, otherwise known as NYSERDA, and the technical experts of the Epidemic Task Force of the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers, also known as ASHRAE. Can you please advance the slide? All right, before I introduce the speakers for today, I'd like to address a few housekeeping items. During this event, all audience members are muted upon entry. Um, in terms of run of show, we will hear from all of our presenters, and then after the ASHRAE portion of the presentation, the event will conclude with a final Q&A period uh, with the remaining time so that you can ask any burning questions uh, that you may have of our presenters. Um, we encourage you to submit questions and comments in writing through the Q&A feature uh, at any time during the event. And for visibility, the chat function on WebEx has also been disabled. Um, we often get this question over the course uh, of our webinar, so I thought that I'd address it up front. Um, today's materials, along with the recording of the webinar, will be posted to nyserta.ny.gov slash flextech. Um, so if you're looking for those materials, that's how you can find them once the webinars have concluded. Uh, also, should any technical problems arise uh, for you as audience members, please don't hesitate to contact Sal Graven um, from the NYSERDA events team at the email address on the bottom of the slide, and he'll, he'll help you sort out any issues that you may be having. I'm going to be going on momentarily. And now on to introductions. <laughs> slide. All right, so we've got some fantastic presenters lined up for you today. Um, to kick off our presentation, we'll be hearing opening comments from Patrick O'Shai, uh, NYSERDA's Director of Market Development and lead for NYSERDA's commercial and industrial programs. Um, after Patrick sets the stage for the discussion, Lindsay June, uh, Senior Project Manager uh, and from TRC and Staff Augmentation uh, Project Manager for the, uh, for the Efficiency Planning and Engineering Team at NYSERDA. Uh, will provide an in, uh, in-depth exploration of the recently completed NYSERDA Energy Efficient Indoor Air Quality Studies and their overall results. Um, following Lindsay's portion of the presentation, we'll be hearing from members of the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force, otherwise known as the ETF, on COVID-19 best practices for commercial buildings. Presenting on behalf of the ETF will be Dr. William Banfle, PhD, PE, uh, Fellow and Presidential Member of ASHRAE, um, FASME, ISIAQ Chair, ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force, uh, and Professor of Architectural Engineering at Penn State. We'll also be hearing from Wade Conlin, uh, PE, member of the ASHRAE, a member of ASHRAE, pardon me, BCXP, uh, CXA, which means that he is a commissioning agent, lead AP BDNC, Commissioning and Energy Discipline Manager at Hanson Professional Services Incor uh, Incorporated. Um, and last but most certainly not least, we'll be hearing from uh, Luke Leung. Luke is a lead fellow, ASHRAE fellow, ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force Commercial Team Leader, ASHRAE Task Force uh, on Building Decarbonization Member, um, Carbon Leadership Forum MEP 2040 Founding Chair, BOMA uh, Toronto Health Committee Co-Chair, Chair of the ASHRAE Environmental Health Committee, ASHRAE Distinguished Lecturer. Um, Luke is also uh, the wide firm Director of Sustainability Engineering uh, Studio for Skidmore, Owens and Merrill LLP, and his work includes the Burj Khalifa, uh, currently the world's most tallest building. And with that, um, I'd like to hand the presentation over to Patrick to get the ball rolling. Uh, Patrick, are you there? I just wanna start off by, with just a quick story of how we got here. Um, in early 2021, NYSERDA was in the pro or 2020, NYSERDA was in the process of negotiating an MOU with ASHRAE. And we were making progress on that um, as the pandemic began. Uh, immediately after the pandemic and the uh, information about how COVID was spread uh, began to uh, filter out, and the ASHRAE Global Pandemic Task Force issued initial um, operating guidance for buildings, we were, up, we were approached, I think, within 48 hours by the Real Estate Board of New York. Their members had looked at the guidance, had looked at the operational and energy impacts of the guidance, and their sustainability 
committee had reached out through Zach Steinberg, vice president at Rebney, and asked NYSERDA if NYSERDA could help them work through this and talked about the potential impacts to their, to their buildings. Um, this gave us an opportunity to really to tie our, our work in the large commercial sector in New York with our MOU with, with ASHRAE, and we quickly began thinking through how could we possibly weigh into this. What came out of it in a period of about four weeks was an initial $1 million offer to fund studies in New York State uh, on buildings that looked at indoor air quality, uh, energy use, and operational impacts. And uh, we got that out into the market uh, at a really fast rate of speed for NYSERDA and uh, ended up raising the offer to $2 million. So we were able to find $2 million of funding. So I do want to thank my team. So uh, we have Joanna Moore, who has been heading our flex tech program for a number of years, and she got tasked with a lot of like, how do we make this happen work? And then Matt Christopher and uh, Lindsay June are part of that team. You'll hear from Lindsay later. Also, I want to I want to thank Aaron Shucker and uh, and our team that worked on getting the website up. So being able to communicate this as quickly as we did. And Heather Fox would be the other person I want to thank. And I want to thank the uh, engineering firms that participated in the study, A AKF Engineers, Bergman Associates, Edison Energy LLC, MCOR Services Bethlehem, Goldman Copeland Associates PC, Gus DeConzo Consulting Engineers PC, Jaros Baum and Bowles Consulting Engineers LLP, Labella Associates DPC, Siska Hennessy Group, Vidaris Inc., and Wendell Energy Services. And also, I want to thank any of you who are in today's conference that were building owners who decided you wanted to work on indoor air quality and efficiency and get it right going forward. And then finally, I want to thank the ASHRAE and the ASHRAE Pandemic Task Force and the resources that they've brought uh, to this effort. And I want to again thank Bill and Wade and Luke, and on with the presentation. Thank you, Joe. All right, thank you, Patrick, for those opening remarks and for acknowledging the people and partnerships that have been just so pivotal in developing the research that we're about to hear more about, and for providing some invaluable context uh, for the presentations from Lindsay June, <clears throat> excuse me, and from the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force. And so now, uh, without further delay, uh, on to Lindsay June, <clears throat> excuse me, from NYSERDA and TRC for an in-depth exploration of the recently completed NYSERDA Energy Efficient Indoor Air Quality Studies uh, and their overall results. Lindsay? Great, thanks, Joe. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, so as was mentioned, I led the select group of 11 flex tech consultants in completing 45 energy efficiency indoor air quality studies, which spanned 83 commercial buildings throughout New York State across 10 commercial sectors. The 11 consultants were competitively selected based on their experience with projects of a similar scope that explored mechanical system and building control interventions in line with areas of focus of these studies. So they collected data, they crunched numbers to quantify the energy implications of the early epidemic scenario building operation guidance that was in the market that predominantly focused on suppressing the transmission of COVID-19 in commercial buildings through indoor air dilution strategies, such as increasing the amount of outdoor air to dilute particle concentration. They then took it a step further by exploring if and how a similar level of COVID-19 transmission risk could be achieved while integrating energy efficiency as a core goal. So during this presentation, we'll look at the findings and the key takeaways from these studies and uncover whether IAQ and energy efficiency are truly opposing forces or if an intersection exists between IAQ and energy efficiency strategies to enable healthy building environments along with the continuation of energy efficiency strides that are already underway. We'll also reveal the various analysis approaches used by the FlexSight consultants to quantify IAQ, many of which are open source tools available to the public. 
So before we review the results from the studies, it's first important to understand the parameters that the FlexTech consultants were bound to in order to draw meaningful conclusions from the results. Next slide. So the goal of the studies was to ensure consistent study parameters across all 45 studies. Uh, and these parameters consisted on uh, focusing on building systems that affect IAQ. So ventilation, filtration, ultraviolet germicidal radiation, or UVGI, and building controls. So the studies excluded incorporation of any major mechanical improvement or energy efficiency projects that were unrelated to these focus systems, such as heating and cooling system upgrades or lighting upgrades. Alternative air cleaning solutions, such as bipolar ionization or photohydroionization technology, were also not supported under this effort. As at the time of these studies um, commenced, there was no evidence of third party, independent, unbiased testing that concluded that these technologies were effective in the context of SARS CoV 2 and safe uh, to building occupants in the context of generating byproducts that are harmful to human health. So the consultants had to evaluate two different packages. The first we deemed the ASHRAE package. This consisted of evaluating the feasibility and energy impact and the IAQ effectiveness of the guidance set forth by the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force that was available to the market at the time the studies commenced. Um, and these are the versions of those documents listed here on the slides. The second package was deemed the energy efficiency package, and this consisted of evaluating strategies that would enable a more energy efficient solution while maintaining the IAQ effectiveness of the ASHRAE package or of a deemed IAQ target. So the results of the package evaluations needed to be presented in comparison to specific baselines. So the ASHRAE package needed to be compared to the pre-COVID building operation energy use baseline, and then the energy efficiency package needed to be compared to the ASHRAE package of measures energy use baseline. Final note um, is that 100% occupancy, occupancy was assumed for these projects. Uh, so the results could enable buildings to resume prior occupancy levels. So let's look at, dig a little deeper into the measures that were designated in each of these packages. Next slide. So because ASHRAE's guidance has evolved since these studies commenced, which they'll be covering in the second half of this presentation, not all of these measures represent ASHRAE's current guidance. However, to understand the basis of these studies, we'll review these measures included in the ASHRAE package for these studies. So for ventilation, it included maximizing outdoor air levels as much as the system's cooling and heating coils can handle. Um, where there's DAV systems, maximizing outdoor air when economizing. Operating air handling units 24-7 or performing a pre and post building occupancy flush. Running bathroom exhaust 24-7 and disabling demand control ventilation or energy recovery ventilation if a potential for cross-contamination exists. For filtration, um, the minimum was MERV 13 or 14, and local HEPA portable units operating at 2 ACH. Uh, humidification, the target was between 40 and 60% relative humidity. So while uh, UVGI is a technology that is endorsed by ASHRAE both currently and when the studies had commenced, it was analyzed within the energy efficient measures package due to it acting as that enabling mechanism for reducing airborne transmission and less energy intensive solutions. Now for the energy efficiency package of measures. Next slide. So these included for ventilation, modifying outdoor air levels and building flush parameters and potentially reinstating demand control ventilation and or energy recovery ventilation. For filtration, the studies explored various MERV rated filter levels with and without electrostatic charges and portable HEPA units, some with UVGI incorporated into them. There were several applications for UVGI air treatment that were evaluated, um, the most prominent being an air handling unit, uh, which is typically placed near coils or filters. In duct, uh, where there's typically long runs of duct uh, that provide lots of room for UVGI. Upper room, which are wall-mounted fixtures, typically installed seven feet or higher, and the rays extend upward to treat the upper room air, and there's no direct contact with applicants, um, occupants. 
Ceiling mounted is typically an enclosed unit with a fan that circulates air through for treatment. In ceiling plenum or mechanical electrical room plenum, where the plenum acts as the air mixing zone, low air velocities make them a good application. And then in fan box units or in fan coil units, um, there are small devices that can fit within these units and be effective. For building controls, uh, the studies looked at sequence modifications, occupancy-based controls, kitchen ventilation controls, and retro commissioning. And then some studies touched on some other strategies at a high level. So some looked at high-level review of airflow patterns in occupied spaces, while others reviewed some studies regarding viral transmission pathways of uh, SARS-CoV-2 through HVAC systems. Um, IAQ monitoring, there are a few monitoring devices that can detect SARS-CoV-2 and other infectious diseases, but they're expensive. So the most common products available in the market track contaminants that can at best serve as proxies for infectious disease. So they detect things such as PM 2.5, which is the particulate size that causes significant health concerns in humans when inhaled. CO2, which is the byproduct of human breathing and an indicator of fresh air levels in a space. Humidity, so within that range of 40 to 60%, is the range where the human bronchial system performs the best and infectious disease are most susceptible to damage. For space pressurization, uh, this wasn't a real prominent focus of these studies, but some did touch on it, and there are some limitations to the strategy that we'll touch on later. And then for IAQ, non-IAQ energy efficiency, although not intended for inclusion in these studies, some strategies did enlist non-IAQ related energy efficiency measures such as lighting, motor upgrades, low flow fixtures, and HVAC capital improvements. So with those potential measures identified, the next step was determine, to determine the analysis approach. Next slide. So unlike energy efficiency analysis, where there's a well-established method for evaluating building systems and quantifying the impact of potential improvements, which our flex tech consultants are well-versed in, at the onset of these studies, and even to an extent today, there's no standardized approach for evaluating the intersection of infectious disease IAQ mitigation and energy efficiency strategies. So as a result, the energy analysis were generally aligned across the studies, either a spreadsheet-based manual calculations or using modeling simulation tool was used. Well, a significant amount of effort was invested in exploring approaches for quantifying the risk of airborne infectious disease exposure via HVAC interventions that resulted in a wide array of evaluation methods um, employed in the studies. So at a high level, the initial step in the analysis was to determine the feasibility of the potential measures based on building characteristics and or owner or tenant requirements. And then once feasible measures were identified, the analysis of the energy impacts and risk of transmission were conducted. So the final step consisted of compiling an energy efficiency package of measures that met or exceeded the transmission risk of the ASHRAE package. Some consultants evaluated measures independently and selected the best one-off options for the final energy efficiency package, while others evaluated scenarios of packages and then selected the best package scenario as the final energy efficiency package. So before diving into the results, I just want to take another moment to review some of the various airborne exposure reduction analysis approaches that were used in the study. Next slide. So the most predominant method used in the studies was calculating the effective air changes per hour, or EACH, as a proxy for IAQ. So where air changes per hour, the ACH, is the rate of the total volume of air in a space being replaced with fresh or clean air, EACH is a quantification of the effectiveness of various air cleaning strategies, so some combination of dilution ventilation, filtration, and UVGI. EACH is calculated by adding the ACH of the individual strategies, and then the EACH can be compared to or stacked with strategies to meet a desired EACH target. So while there is no standard EACH target that's ubiquitous to all buildings, Harvard and UC Boulder developed a portable air cleaner calculator for schools that recommends a minimum of five EACH for excellent IAQ and notes that whether, 
while the calculator was developed specifically for schools, it is applicable to other building sectors. So this target was used in some of our studies. So while the EACH method was a predominant methodology used in the studies, the approach used to calculate the EACH varied across the studies. Next slide. So there are several open source tools that have entered the market since COVID that calculate EACH and that were used in the studies. One such tool um, that calculates EACH was used by multiple consultants in our studies and is the equivalent outdoor air calculator developed by ASHRAE's Epidemic Task Force. So while it was developed to determine the time required to achieve target air changes for a building flush, the tool does calculate EACH values for outdoor air, in air handling unit MER filtration, and in handling unit or portable air cleaners. Um, and tallies, the tool tallies those EACH numbers um, for strategies employed from this simple set of data points uh, noted here on the slide. So on the right hand of the slide, um, this is an example of a manual calculation that were also conducted. So MCOR used this EACH formula for their UVG lighting analysis. So where EAC represents the EACH and is calculated by multiplying the K value, which is the inactivation rate of a specific pathogen for SARS-CoV-2, it happens to be 0.0041. And multiply that by the irradiance of the UVGI lamps or the output intensity, which is the I in the equation, and then T is the exposure time. So a quick side note on UVGI dosing, um, the UVGI dose is the irradiance times the exposure time. And our study found inconsistent guidance of dosing levels needed to achieve 99% inactivation on a single path for coronavirus. But about 1200 microwatt seconds per centimeter squared seems to be the most supported value. So UVGI manufacturers have detailed calculators to determine the appropriate dosing levels needed for a specific UVGI configuration but be cognizant of the target dosing levels they're using to avoid oversizing systems and excessive energy use. Next slide. A few other IQ quantification approaches that stood out from the study conducted are uh, calculating the mitigation effectiveness of infectious disease and comparing that percent effectiveness results across the scenario. So, this first calculation you see here is used by Labella in their studies, and it shows the incremental benefit of multiple air cleaning interventions. Another open source tool used in the studies is the fate of trans and transport of indoor microbiological aerosols, otherwise known as FATIMA. This was developed by NIST and used by Siska Hennessy in their studies. And this tool compares the virus mitigation effectiveness of various combinations of filters and outside air rates to provide airborne concentration metrics, among other outputs. So on the right of the slide here, you can see how Cisco used this tool, uh, the output from the Fatima tool, to quantify the percent reduction in airborne particle concentration of all combinations of outdoor air at 30%, 50%, and 80%, and with MERV filter ratings of 8, 13, and 16. So they created this matrix showing the percent reduction in airborne particle concentration, along with separately calculated percent increase in total energy use and total energy cost in relation to the baseline condition of the building, which is the grayed out box there, um, representing MERV 8 with 30% outdoor air. So what they found was the ASHRAE recommended scenario produced a similar particle reduction, particle concentration reduction as the MERV 16, with 30% or 50% outdoor air, but with a much lower energy use and cost impact. And then there were other consultants that used other open source tools and or relied solely on manufacturer reported effectiveness or EACH. So on to the results. Uh, next slide. So the impact results are examined in two ways across all the studies. So we looked at packaged results in terms of cost, energy use, and mitigation effectiveness. And then we also looked at measure takeaways based on recommended measures and unfeasible measures. So first, let's briefly refresh on the package approaches that we discussed earlier. 
So there were two packages of improvements that were evaluated. First was the ASHRAE package, which was the energy impact compared to the pre-COVID baseline energy use and the IAQ effectiveness of any feasible measure from the guidance that's set forth by the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force back in June of 2020. And then the energy efficiency package uh, included strategies that enabled a more energy efficient solution compared to the ASHRAE baseline package of measures while maintaining the IAQ effectiveness of the ASHRAE package or a deemed IAQ target. All right, now let's go over the energy efficiency package results compared to the ASHRAE baseline package. Next slide. So these results are presented in terms of average values per study. The blue line here represents the ASHRAE baseline and the arrows represent the deviation of energy efficiency package metrics from the ASHRAE baseline. So on the left are the cost impacts in blue and on the right are the energy impacts in yellow. So starting with the cost impacts, Although there is about $188,000 in energy cost savings on average with the energy efficiency package, there was also an implementation cost of about $140,000. And this is mainly due to UVGI systems being more expensive than installing new filters or adjusting outdoor air set points that were part of the ASHRAE package. However, when you combine the implementation costs and the energy impact costs together, the energy efficiency package is more effective than the ASHRAE package by about $49,000. So on the energy impact side, the energy efficiency package saved more electric and thermal energy than the ASHRAE package by about 48,000 kilowatt hours and 8,300 MMBTUs respectively, which equates to about 7,000 in electric cost savings and about 115,000 in thermal cost savings. So the top energy savings measures in comparison to the ASHRAE baseline were reduced outdoor air, non-IAQ measures, reduced building flush time, and control optimization. So as far as the airborne transmission risk reduction is concerned, on average, the EACH of the energy efficiency package was pretty much in line with the ASHRAE package meaning that these, the energy efficiency package savings can be achieved without compromising IAQ. So while this is promising news in respect to the energy efficiency package versus the ASHRAE package based on that early ASHRAE guidance, we do need to consider how the energy efficiency package compares to the pre-COVID building operation. Next slide. So again, these metrics are presented in terms of averages per study. And here we see a different picture. Although there's a significant increase in EACH from the pre-COVID baseline to the energy efficiency package, there's also an increase in energy costs and implementation costs across the board. Although the average energy efficiency package didn't produce energy savings in relation to the pre-COVID baseline, keep in mind that most of the studies intentionally did not include traditional energy efficiency measures which does present an opportunity to reduce the energy use and cost impact of introducing airborne exposure reduction strategies into buildings that would lessen the added energy use and cost from the baseline use case. Um, a good example of this is in the Wendell studies um, for Western, the Western New York School District and the Williamsville Central School District. All right, on to takeaways attained from the measure level recommendations. Next slide. So high level measure based takeaways from the sample set of the pilot studies indicate that extensive strategies may not be necessary to achieve energy efficient IAQ. So the right balance between design outdoor air and increased HVAC system filtration levels with some local air cleaning strategies may be sufficient. Also, there was a range of existing IAQ levels across the studies. So from projects that already met target IAQ levels, such as some museums and office spaces, to those that didn't have any mechanical ventilation in their spaces. And we saw this occurring across a variety of sectors, including schools, colleges, municipal buildings, museums, and transportation. As far as outdoor air levels, increasing outdoor air levels when feasible was the highest energy impact across the studies. 
And because of this, using design outdoor air levels in combination with either filtration or UVGI was a prominent strategy for energy savings. For filtration, um, typically MERS 15 or 16 rated filters or portable HEPA, HEPA filters enable significantly reduced outdoor air levels while achieving equivalent airborne exposure reduction and energy savings and can be equally effective as UVGI with lower first cost and maintenance cost. On the building flush side, it's important to calculate the time needed for a 95% viral rem removal from a for a building flush and factor in your outdoor air levels and your filtration levels and your air cleaning treatment in order to minimize the flush time needed. And for demand control ventilation, um, it was found to keep that disabled during any epidemic situation. Next slide. For in-air handling unit UVGI, um, this was the most recommended strategy uh, for UVGI across all, almost all the sectors. Um, other UVGI technologies recommended included, um, in order of prominence, upper room, induct, sandbox unit, fan coil unit, in mechanical electrical room, and portable UVGI. So in air handling unit effectiveness is based on the amount of recirculation, recirculated air is treating. So UVGI will have minimal impact in 100% outdoor air units, such as MAUs. Um, in, air, in air handling unit, UVGI may also not be more beneficial from a cost and energy use perspective than increasing outdoor air when maintenance costs are factored in. Then finally, strategic placement in air handling units can also provide an added benefit of coil cleaning for additional energy savings. So facing the UVGI towards the wetted surfaces like cooling coils or drain pans can prevent biofilm buildup and increase heat transfer and energy efficiency. Upper room UVGI is a good application for buildings where single air handling units serve multiple spaces, but only certain spaces need enhanced airborne exposure mitigation. Um, upper room can be more cost effective than installing a new mechanical ventilation system for spaces that don't currently have mechanical or passive ventilation capabilities. Upper room is also good for high risk, high density and or transient occupancy areas, such as nurses offices, lobbies, lounges, locker rooms, open or shared office spaces, conference rooms, kitchens, cafeterias, restrooms or corridors. And then local HEPA filtration units may be equally effective and less costly to install and maintain than upper room UVGI. Then for in return duct UVGI, this may be a good application where there's no room in the air handling units or rooftop units for UVGI, or where there's a ducted air distribution system that's conditioned by heat pumps located throughout the duct work, which is um, what we did see in one of our projects. Next slide. So from the sample set of these pilot studies, the following considerations should be incorporated into evaluations to determine the feasibility of measures. So the first thing to consider is limitations of the existing infrastructure. So while there are a number of takeaways here, I'll just touch on a few in more detail. Um, so there are several scenarios where outdoor air rates cannot be increased, such as units that are already right sized, uh, units that have fixed minimum outdoor air levels that can't be adjusted, 100% makeup air units, such as perimeter units in office buildings or healthcare critical spaces, such as labs or operating rooms. And while there's only one MAU that provides outdoor air to numerous air handling units, if that's the scenario in your building, um, under this scenario, the MAU may not be able to operate when the air handling units are off. On the other hand, oversized units that do have capacity to significantly increase outdoor air rates can pose issues meeting comfort set points and proper system functionality if outside air is increased to the max possible. Physical restrictions may be typical with custom built up air handling units and fan coil units or unit ventilators, such as being able to accommodate higher MERV rated filters. Increased MERV filtration levels doesn't always introduce a pressure drop or capacity issues, 
units with VFDs can moderate accordingly for low impact. In air handling unit or in DOPT UVGI may be too costly to implement for the required system size in order to provide sufficient dosing due to high air velocities. And then consider the ease of installation and maintenance for UVGI installations, such as accessibility to lamps for changeouts, um, in DOPT particularly could be challenging, or where MERs serve as the mixed air plenum with low air velocities, um, it's easier to install UVGI there than say in air handling units upstream of coils. Um, uh, but where those systems are easily accessible, UVGI um, uh, safety precautions especially need to be um, implemented to prevent exposure. And then major renovations um, may be needed to implement central humidification, such as new control and monitoring points for the BMS, um, a, a source of distilled or filtered water and electricity, and or drip drain, drip or drain pan retrofits. Uh, so spaces that have single zone equipment, such as schools with unit ventilators, um, may make it difficult to install a central humidification system since there is no central HVAC infrastructure already present. And then practical applications of differential rate pressurization um, may not exist due to HVAC zoning configuration open space layout and or equipment limitations, such as exhaust fan capability or ductwork layout. Um, so this also may require major, major renovation to implement and cause disruption to base building systems. All right, next slide. Another consideration is owner, tenant, and space use restrictions. Um, some HVAC units have critical, um, third critical spaces rather, uh, such as healthcare and museum settings, and can't be altered in any way that would impact those space conditions. Lease arrangements may also prevent modified settings and operation and system implementation, depending on who owns um, or operates or has control of um, the unit. And then aesthetic requirements are a real consideration. So for example, upper room UVGI is most beneficial in large assembly spaces, but if these spaces are within tenant areas, it may require tenant buy-in. And then there's also the installation disturbances that need to be factored in. And then finally, evaluating health implications is also important. So as I mentioned before, there are safety concerns with UVC exposure to humans. So ensure that any in-room application does not present exposure potential and that safeguards are in place for maintenance activities for systems in units. And then look for third-party unbiased testing results that are applicable or relatable to COVID-19 when considering any emerging technology. And this is to ensure that there are no harmful byproducts and the technology is effective for its intended use. Next slide. So these study, studies showed that it is possible for buildings to operate in a manner during epidemic conditions that reduce airborne transmission risk without a significant impact to energy use and cost relative to the ASHRAE COVID operations guidance that these studies followed. And this can be done by implementing a smart combination of measures around the primary focus of these studies, which was ventilation, air cleaning, controls, and filtration. So insights presented here today into the analysis methodologies and the measure considerations can act as a starting point for further investigation in identifying the combination of strategies best suited for your building. There's many more details, resources, and takeaways within the individual study reports themselves that are posted on our FlexTech IAQ webpage. We'll also be adding case studies and final conclusion reports in the next few months, so check back for that additional information. So to conclude, the optimal process for determining an energy efficiency IAQ strategy is to start by determining if spaces meet code minimum ventilation requirements and inspect systems for proper operation and make adjustments as necessary. 
um, such as outside and return air dampers are functioning correctly or ERDs are not cross-contaminating airstreams. Um, the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force documents um, have guidance for system evaluation. Um, NYSERDA also um, developed an IAQ best practices guide for colleges and universities that's posted on the uh, IAQ website that has a systems evaluation checklist based off of ASHRAE's uh, guidance documents. And this is also applicable to other commercial sectors. Next is to use the EACH method to determine your baseline IAQ. So the extent of airborne exposure reduction strategies that may be needed is dependent on the current airborne pathogen exposure risk that's in spaces currently. So once the need for improved IAQ is determined, then survey the systems in place to determine applicable strategies. And these strategies will be dependent on the existing HVAC system functionality and capability. And then finally, calculate the EACH and energy impact of potential measures to assemble the optimal scenario. And remember that stack strategies will result in diminishing returns. Um, also consider long-term energy cost impacts of measures and not just upfront implementation costs. Um, exploring traditional energy efficiency measures in addition to IAQ-focused IAQ measures can limit increased energy use and costs above existing building operations. And then for next steps, there are opportunities that exist to further facilitate the pairing of energy efficiency and IAQ, such as the development of standardized evaluation process uh, for infectious disease and IAQ mitigation evaluation in concert with energy efficiency and also to establish target EACH levels that are appropriate for various building typologies. And then promotion of mainstream adoption of energy efficient IAQ evaluations and strategies into building design and retrofit projects to continue to fight climate change while making indoor spaces a healthier environment for occupants. And the final slide, please. Um, so here we leave you with a few resources. Um, if you're interested in energy efficiency and IAQ and discovering that combination of measures that best suits your facility, you can contact um, our Flex Tech Consultants at this Find a Flex Tech Consultant webpage link. Um, questions can be directed to flextech at nyserta.ny.gov. And thank you to all the consultants and customers that participated in these studies and allowed us to share these insights with the larger commercial building sector. Back to you, Joe. All right, thank you, Lindsay, for that fantastic presentation and for getting into such significant detail on those IAQ studies and their results. I'm sure that all the information that you just presented will be absolutely invaluable to commercial building owners and uh, the commercial building owners in attendance as they operate their buildings moving forward. Um, and for the service providers that support them as they work to uh, keep building occupants in the broader community safe from the coronavirus during the, the ongoing pandemic. Um, with that, uh, I'm going <coughs> to hand the conversation over to Dr. Bill Bonfleth, uh, Chair of the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force and the team from ASHRAE, to talk about the COVID-19 best practices for commercial buildings. Bill? Okay, thank you, Joe. Uh, I, I wanted to say just very briefly that we uh, really appreciate the partnership with NYSERDA through the uh, the MOU, and I think it's been beneficial in both directions, and we've certainly uh, benefited from the feedback. So our ASHRAE uh, segment of the, the webinar is a review of where we are currently with guidance and how to implement it and how it uh, plays out in uh, commercial buildings. So if we could advance two slides. One, yep, there we go. Uh, so I will uh, review the, the ASHRAE core recommendations and Wade Conlon will follow on uh, discussing how to implement them through the building readiness guidance and then Luke Leung will uh, discuss the commercial building applications. Next, please. And next. So we're, we're discussing here the, uh, the, the one page core recommendations that ASHRAE has developed that uh, summarizes current guidance. And I want to start by saying that uh, our, our guidance is uh, based on our view of uh, the risk of infection. The, the latest CDC statement on transmission of SARS-CoV-2 uh, emphasizes inhalation risk and also uh, deposition or droplet spray 
uh, as as being important uh, factors in transmission and to some extent touching, but mainly inhalation, and that's what uh, we primarily are addressing through ASHRAE's guidance. Next. So the core recommendations were uh, released in, in early January, and they summarize uh, all of our, our recommendations, which are fleshed out in something like 400 pages of, of guidance. Uh, I need to say that they're significantly different from where we started. I think that everyone who was uh, issuing guidance back in uh, April, May of last year was being very conservative and uh, uh, trying to identify everything that could possibly be done, and there wasn't really um, a lot of uh, deep analysis going on about what the implications would be for energy or operating costs. And of course, we thought they would be temporary. None of this was intended to be permanent uh, changes that would result in these levels of operating difference. Uh, but where we are now is with a, uh, a set of recommendations that allow a flexible approach uh, to local circumstances based on technical feasibility, budget, energy and operating cost, and how well um, we control the indoor environment, which is really very consistent with uh, what came out of the NYSERDA studies. Next. Uh, we begin simply with uh, a recommendation to follow public health guidance. It's very important. Uh, HVAC is, is simply one layer in what should be a multi-layered risk mitigation uh, plan. And so everything that you're being told by public health authorities about PPE and uh, occupancy controls and hygiene and now vaccinations is important because uh, COVID is transmitted by multiple modes and any one layer um, may be um, effective against uh, one mode and not effective against others. And we know that a layered strategy is the most effective. And uh, we also are very strong on mask use because it reduces emission rates and uh, reduces inhalation rates indoors. Next. I think the, the maybe the most important section of, of the guidance, or at least the one that uh, addresses some of the key issues is ventilation, filtration, and air cleaning. And the first item here is, is that uh, we recommend providing at least the minimum outdoor airflow rates uh, required by code. Uh, why is it important to say this? Uh, first of all, because the early guidance was uh, extreme. It said uh, bring in as much outdoor air as you can. And in fact, many, uh, not ASHRAE, were uh, recommending to not have any recirculation and just go 100% outdoor air. Uh, the, the second uh, reason is that other controls may be equally effective and better in other respects, for example, uh, impact on energy use. Uh, code minimum ventilation is important because it's the baseline for indoor air quality. So um, that's the, the reasons for, for this one. Next. Two point two uh, addresses filters, and initially uh, we said rather uh, uh, bluntly uh, use MERV thirteen filters for recirculating airstreams, and uh, this has been modified to uh, a statement that combinations of filters and air cleaners that achieve that level of performance are acceptable. So that could mean using uh, multiple filters in series that aren't MERV thirteen or using MERV thirteen. Uh, using a lower MERV filter with some kind of air cleaner. Uh, why is this important? The minimum standard filters, the MERV 8s that we find in, in uh, minimum standards for commercial buildings aren't effective for infectious aerosols. Uh, HEPA filters, which uh, some were trying to make a requirement for uh, central air distribution systems are not feasible uh, and an expensive retrofit. MERV-13 has a good efficiency for respiratory aerosols, and this approach allows trade-offs when that can't be done. Next. So those two things said, minimum outdoor air and uh, MERV-13 filtration, keep in mind that this may not provide uh, what you would consider a sufficient level of risk mitigation and additional controls may be needed. Next. So now to... Uh, air cleaning uh, and air cleaners. Uh, our statement here is only use air cleaners for which evidence of effectiveness and safety is clear. Uh, why? Because uh, many air cleaners that are in the market do not have a, a very clear 
uh, evidence basis for their effectiveness and we don't have test procedures for many of them. And there are some questions about whether the, some of them are even safe depending on what their byproducts are. Uh, ASHRAE believes ultraviolet germicidal irradiation is uh, known to be effective and safe when used properly. So that's why it's noted in our guidance. Uh, users who want to do other things need to evaluate the literature, and there is a growing amount of literature on how different air cleaners perform and what byproducts they produce. Next. But combining controls addresses uh, what uh, Lindsay was describing as a, uh, an equivalent air change approach. Uh, select options, including standalone filters and air cleaners that uh, provide the desired level of exposure reduction or risk mitigation while minimizing associated energy penalties. So this is simply saying that that's a, a good approach to use. Um, it's uh, consistent with equivalent air change approaches and permits trade-offs. The uh, main issue here is that we don't have consensus risk mitigation targets. We have some statements like the one that was noted from Harvard and uh, Colorado, but that may be something we can discuss in, in Q&A. Uh, coming up with a target that you feel comfortable with is still something that uh, requires some judgment. Next. So moving on to uh, air distribution, uh, we are giving a, a soft endorsement for mixing as a good way to reduce risk because uh, distributing uh, infectious aerosol as uniformly as possible in a space tends to lower the concentration to which anyone is exposed. And also um, this uh, recommendation uh, discourages the use of air distribution that creates strong drafts. In the upper right, you see a well-known example of a restaurant where there were infections associated with uh, high velocity airflows caused by the interaction of the air conditioning components. And in the lower uh, right figure, you see an example of stratification of uh, exhaled air in a displacement ventilation system. So uh, we feel that these at the moment are, are the best recommendations and, and are not strongly recommending making any changes to existing air distribution systems. Next. Uh, with respect to temperature and, and humidity control, uh, we recommend for the pandemic maintaining temperature and humidity design set points that are existing. So if buildings are humidified, that's great. ASHRAE recommends humidifying between uh, about 30 and, and 60 percent. But if a building isn't humidified, that's not the first thing that we would recommend. Uh, why? Because uh, there's evidence that there's less potential impact of humidification and temperature variation within allowable limits than for other controls. And uh, we know that some buildings could not tolerate uh, humidification in the winter because of the condition of their uh, envelopes. And also it's expensive as the, some of these nicer to sponsored studies have shown. Next. Uh, we also have a number of recommendations that we've grouped under the heading of, of uh, system operations. So with respect to operation of ventilation systems, maintain the equivalent clean air supply required at design whenever anyone's present. Uh, the importance of this is that it um, implicitly is saying don't use demand controlled ventilation to reduce outdoor air to save energy uh, based on occupancy because that increases risk. And the other is that uh, we should ventilate whenever occupants are there, uh, but not necessarily 24 seven. Next. Uh, the next deals with this issue of, of flushing. Initially, uh, we were, were recommending a fairly long flush before and after every uh, uh, working day for, for an office building. And now the statement is uh, flush spaces between occupied periods when necessary for a time equivalent to achieve three air changes of equivalent clean air supply. Uh, the importance of this is that it uh, is uh, moving away from the 24 seven operation requirement that we don't think is necessary and is energy wasteful and expensive. Uh, it establishes a, a minimum 
clearance time, three year changes will get us to about 95% clearance in an ideal mixed uh, space uh, situation. You can go farther with more air changes, but this is a, a good move in that direction. And it also emphasizes that filtered and treated air count towards the total. So you may only have two air changes of outdoor air, which means it takes an hour and a half to do three air changes. But if there's good filtration and high recirculation rate through the filters, it could be 20, 30 minutes. Next. Uh, with respect to reentry of contaminants, our recommendation is to limit reentry from energy devices and outdoor air intakes and others to acceptable levels. Uh, initially, the recommendation for many sources was to disable ERVs. And uh, thinking about that more deeply, we found that most ERVs can probably operate safety, safely and have uh, put guidance in place for that. Um, we also need to pay attention to unintentional airflow paths because we have seen evidence that uh, plumbing systems and uh, natural ventilation shafts can be sources of reentry as well. Next. And then finally, system commissioning. Uh, it's very important that systems be uh, checked to make sure that they're operating up to their design intent. We know that many systems are poorly maintained, and, and so uh, we really don't know what level of protection they're providing under those uh, circumstances. And, and also, uh, it's well known that if we keep systems commissioned, we're likely to save energy as well. So this also works in the direction of uh, the recommendation or the, the desire to save energy. Next. So that concludes a, a very brief uh, overview of the core recommendations. I, I co-authored an article on it with another task force member that is available uh, free of charge. You can download and read some more commentary on it. I've, I've got the uh, URL, URL there on the slide and my contact information. And with that, I'll uh, conclude and we'll move on to wait in the uh, building readiness guidance. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. So let's go to the next slide. And we're going to talk about the building readiness guide. Next slide. This is an infographic that was built to, to try and help people understand what is on the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force uh, website. Uh, the upper left corner, you can see the core recommendations uh, that Bill just went over. Uh, the building readiness, uh, my team built the infographic, which is probably why that's the most prominent in the middle. And on the building guides, the commercial one, uh, that's where Luke's going to talk about offices later on. But there's a lot more information than what we're showing here, and this can help you find it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, when you're doing the building readiness, you want to have goals, right? And, and key one, you know, understand how systems work. Bill talked about commissioning things, right? But while you're doing this, and, and this is, is where Lindsay was getting into, is, is not, let's not just look at for safety things. Let's look for energy. Um, I, I mean, excuse me, for virus transmission, let's look for safety and energy, right? So you're already evaluating your systems. Identify those items. Um, you do need to talk through these uh, with the owners, the stakeholders, and then actually implement things to make, uh, make the, the systems perform better. Um, and then creating a building readiness plan, which really is a document that's trying to explain to people what you're doing in your facility to have it, have it um, uh, uh, work against the virus transmission, uh, you know, whether it's the non-HVAC items or the HVAC items, but that way you can convey, here, here's everything we're going to be doing in this. Um, the next slide shows a, uh, um, a work order. This is when you're doing your evaluation, standard commissioning type thing, use Excel, start listing everything, right? And so it's uh, the DOAS system. This was the old ASHRAE headquarters, uh, talked about increased ventilation and then other items we found, right? Um, as we discussed this unit and we talked about it, there's energy things in here. There's operational things like this had separate condensing units for each circuit and a couple of them were failed. So we wrote, hey, you need to get the, 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 ma the deferred maintenance. You need to get the facilities maintenance team out there to get those up and working because we need to make sure that we've got the outside air. Um, and then what you find is when you meet with your owner, um, and you go through all the things you found, a lot of those energy items or those safety items will say, hey, we're going to take that and we're going to put that into our CMMS. So you don't necessarily, they don't, so you don't necessarily need to report them here, but at least they're, they're picking up on more, uh, you know, energy savings um, while they're also trying to make their, their systems uh, uh, um, safer for the occupant. So next slide, please. Um, 
mitigation strategies is not eliminate. It's a, it's a key thing. Um, we are we are mitigating. You are reducing. Uh, we're not eliminating. Um, it's just not possible. So uh, uh, you know, Bill Bill could be sitting a foot from me and sneeze while I was yawning. I'm, I, you know, no HVAC is going to overcome that. So uh, next slide. Um, Going to touch on a couple things that have been added since the the, the guidance has come out, and, and more so, and actually is coming up back around is the impact on a hot water coil. This is a, a in a preheat position, so prior to the unit, 100% outside air. We did this with a chilled water coil to see how much more capacity you could get out. Um, on the chilled water coil, it, you know, we lock in the coil, the, the 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 manufacturer who is selecting it, and just started increasing the airflow, and you can see at about 45% a. Uh, 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 you know, 4,500 CFM instead of 2,000. The manufacturer's coil selection program said, "Do not, do not run this coil here." So, if you're going to increase ventilation, which Lindsay showed is uh, potentially a higher cost uh, to, than than filters and other things, but if you're going to do that, sometimes the limitation is actually on the coil, and sometimes it's actually on the plant or the the heat source itself. So, uh, the next slide talks about uh, filters. Um, and we keep talking about MERV ratings and what can we get. One of the th key things that goes along with this, and this is something that I, I recommend uh, to owners is, to do, is that how well these filters are installed is critical. Uh, the study done by uh, Dr. Siegel, who's this is uh, their their modeling. They've done uh, he's done two or three in site or in situ tests that have. Um, corroborated the, the modeling data. It's just that the modeling uh, report has the prettiest table to show. Um, and you can see in that table, the MERV 15 with a 10 millimeter gap. So the, the bottom right corner, 10 millimeter gap is 0.4 inch, um, operates like a MERV 8. So, you know, Dr. Siegel is quoted in, in some articles as saying is I'd rather have a well installed MERV 11 than a poorly installed MERV 15. And so what we do recommend to facilities owners is for their filter changing crew is to do an integrity test like you would do on lab or BSL 3 uh, exhaust to make sure that you are actually they're installed well and capturing. Do it on one of your air handling units after they change the filters. Do an integrity test, see what they need to do differently so that they can make sure that they're installing them well. Um, it's, a, it's a key component to having filters is how well they're installed. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, so we'll get into the flushing calculations. This is the, the, the main, uh, the, getting in the new materials. Bill discussed this already, which is three air changes. We're assuming it's steady state. There's no contaminant being generated. So if I change the building volume three times, I end up with 90. I end up with 0.05 left, which means 95% removal. Now, if I have a, a different space that has a lot higher risk, uh, um, it, you know, let's say you have a cafeteria in your area, or you have other spaces that are just going to be a gymnasium, you might want to go five air changes, which gets you 99 get you the 99% removal. So that's part of that adjusting that risk for your level. But as a starting point, we're saying the three air changes. Next slide. Um, when we talk about flushing, and you've heard this, Lindsay kept talking about it, which was uh, equivalent, to me, it's equivalent outdoor air. Some are calling it, you know, air, equivalent air changes. To me, I'm using, everyone understands a bit of outdoor air, you know, uh, 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 dilution is the solution to pollution, right? Well. They get the outdoor air piece, but what we're trying to say is if we have other other items that we can use to create equivalent outdoor air, the AC, ACHE, right? Everyone uses acronyms slightly different. And so you can see that formula on the top, right? It's taking the air changes of OA, it's taking the air changes of the F, which is the filter, and it's taking the air changes of the E comma C, which is the air cleaner in this in this scenario in the in the diagram on the right, you can see that we've used UV. And then plus the inch air changes of in-room cleaners, because that could be portable HEPA, that could be more UV, that could be other stuff, right? Um, the EZ that you see in front of the stuff that's coming from the main system is to take into account the standard 62 room air uh, distribution effectiveness, because that distribution plays a part into is the outside air really, is the equivalent outdoor air really flushing out or, or removing the contaminant that you think it is, right? One of the key things to focus on that diagram is the order that it's in. It's a mixed air unit, filter, your coils, UV, and then your supply fans. And the order is important, right? So now we understand outdoor air, turn it into air changes, right? Uh, Lindsay showed us the calculations on how to get the, the air changes. Let's go to, but so now let's take a look at the filter and, and what is its impact? And on the next slide, um, we talk about the potential of, okay, if we have a filter, it's MERV rated, it's MERV rated in three different particle size, right? 
point three in the table on the right, the point three to one micron, one to three micron, three to ten micron. That's how filters are rated in those buckets. So what uh, Stevens and uh, uh, Azimi did is they looked at studies on influenza A to say, can we be predictive as to where viable virus particles will be found, because they don't float around naked, when people ex exhale them, right? And you can see on the bottom of that table, it's 20%, 29%, 51%, right? So if filters are rated in those buckets and we can expect those, those uh, virus, viable virus particles to be approximately in those buckets, we can actually get to a single digit performance for a filter against a virus. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And remember, this is all on influenza A. And so this is uh, charts that are in the uh, uh, Google sheet, uh, that the uh, equivalent outdoor air calculator uh, that we created. Um, the table on the right is the anticipated distribution of virus. So you can see the 20, 29, and 51. You want to be more conservative. You can change those values. Anything in blue you can change. So make the E10. That's the lowest performer for filters. The table on the left is the MERV rating, 4, four to 16. Um, there is no MERV 17. HEP is are tested to a different standard, so you can't have that. Um, but it's, we took uh, over 200 filters of existing filter 52.2 performance data and then summarized it within its MERV rating to say, okay, here's how well they're actually doing. And you basically, you take the E1 average of the filter times how much virus percent you think will be in there, E2 times E2, et cetera. And then you can get your droplet nuclei filter efficiency. That is a single point value that you can say, if I multiply that by the amount of air, recirculated air, not total air, just the recirculated air, because the outdoor air is clean, then I can say, okay, this is how much contaminant, um, here's how much clean air I'm going to have from this filter, depending what I have. And then you say, wait, there's a yellow line and there's a hundred, right? I, it's a, t it's a pivot table to look up. It has to be numerically in order. And so I tried to use the craziest number that I could, and I went with 100 just to try not to confuse anyone. For your situation, if you have your specific filters, which is very important to select the right filter, pleats per inch, et cetera, the pressure drops, the higher MERV doesn't always mean higher pressure drop. You can get stuff that's close. Um, but then you can actually put in your own filter performance for your system instead of an average. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then this, this, that, that information, that's for the filter. Now we need to talk about the air cleaner, the UV, the, the UVGI. The, the filter and the UV and essentially are in filters in series, right? So what I, what the calculation, the, the, the airflow from the air cleaner is really the recirculated airflow times what the filter didn't catch times the efficiency of what the air cleaner is doing. And so the reason is, is that it's filters in series. I can't say that 100% of the contaminants hit the filter and then 100% of the contaminants hit the UV because then I would actually be able to have, if I had 99% UV and 80% effective filters, somehow I'm now creating 179%, uh, uh, you know, it just doesn't work that way. So I have to take that into account. It's very key. The, the, the calculator in that Google sheet, and it is done in this order. If it's in the opposite order or in any different order, you would need to change to calculate the formulas around, but you need to treat them in series. So hopefully that makes sense. And so now I've got that air cleaner and then I can start adding them together. So let's go to the next slide. And then this, this shows the actual calculation table, right? There's a couple tabs in there. Um, and so what I picked is in this scenario is I picked a typical classroom. Um, it's a middle school classroom size. It's just an average size that people are aware of. 900 square feet, 900, nine foot ceiling height, anywhere that is blue text you're gonna put in. Uh, excuse me, I, I gotta fix that. So, but uh, the supply air changes and then your outdoor air changes, right? And you can see that it's the same room with three different samples. And the reason is, is as I come down to about halfway, you can see that I'm changing my MERV rating from eight to 13, right? Sample two and three of 13. I've got UV single pass and activation, 80, a MERV 8 with 85% UV, a 13 with 0%, and then I did a 13 that I actually have one in-room uh, uh, fan HEPA that's got 150 uh, CADR, right? As you move down, then you can start to see the air changes from each of those items and as they, as they come together. And so you can see a MERV 8 filter with 85% UV gets you about the equivalent air changes of nine. Right, where MERV 13 and the out, same outdoor air get you about seven and a half. And if I add an in room, I can get to higher, right? Now, in Lindsay's thing, she was saying, she was talking about five or six and what the target is, and, and, and that's from that classroom. But 
that information hasn't been updated necessarily for the Delta variant. Um, so in any event, this could be for, uh, you know, uh, more of an ESE room or somewhere where you're not going to have masks or other things of that nature. As, as noted, it's the flushing calculator. So you have the three. Uh, you can change that to a five if you want, and you can see the time frame that it's going to take to flush uh, that space between uses. Now, the one thing I do want to point out, this, the documentation says two hours, and there's a reason for that. As engineers, we have to be conservative. If someone, you know, so we assumed a, we looked at units and we said, okay, let's say you had the outdoor air dampers shut. You're going to get a couple percent of outdoor air, and they had MERV 5 filters. That gets you in that two-hour range. We basically said, okay, here's your worst, potential worst-case scenario. What does that look like? And, and that's where you end up at two hours. So doing these calculations is very valuable to save energy. Uh, next slide. Um, one of the things that we really want to stress is that if you've got VAV systems, you've got a max and a min, and where does your system really operate? So this is a lecture hall at a university. Um, put in the information that I had from the boxes, and you can see at minimum, essentially, it's 100% outside air. At maximum, it's almost 2,000 CFM. And as you come down to the bottom, you can see that at maximum, I'm doing 12 and a half air changes. At minimum, I'm doing three air changes. That minimum, somewhere, you know, that's minimum cooling. If you're heating a 60% of, of, of cooling max, you know, you're looking at it, you might be at a much lower. Now, this is, they had MERV 13s and a lot of air. Um, so, but from a standpoint is if you're designed and you say at my max airflow, I'm doing six air to equivalent outdoor air changes, well, if I get into heating, now I'm, I might be down at 3.6 or 4, is that okay, right? So you have to understand where is my system actually operating with its airflow. It plays a very big part uh, when it comes to figuring out your equivalent outdoor air. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, an article that gets into a lot more detail. Uh, it's got the reference there, but it, it links to the Google Sheet. And if you have any questions, there's my email. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it on to Luke to talk about offices and commercial space. Luke? Yeah, thank you, Wade. Next slide. So we're going to focus on office buildings. If there's one big takeaway, Lindsay put the question out there, can we have a relatively safe environment with low energy costs or low energy consumption? So the big, big takeaway here, also suggested by Bill, is if you have a cold required well ventilated building with appropriate filter that's really a good starting point for office buildings and but still you have to look at the risk level next slide why do we say that so let's look at first cause next slide if you change the amount of outside air the first cause is could be really low provided your coil have capacity you just change through the BAS the damper position. So that could be like a $200 sort of change just through the BAS if the system has the capacity. So it's relatively low first cost, but high operating cost. Next slide. But the MERV 13 filter, the first cost is really low. You can see on the screen right now, it's about 0.025 dollar per CFM. This is based on roughly less than 10 studies. It's not exhaustive, but we have about 10 data points. Many of the projects are in New York. Some are in other places. So it's really inexpensive. Next slide. If you look at the air cleaner, air cleaner is about $5 per CFM or $2 per square foot with our data point. This is a commercial building, roughly about 25,000 square feet of floor plate in a floor. So it's actually quite expensive compared to filter. Next slide. Or if uh, one of the reasons why it's expensive is because the clean air delivery rate, in this case, you can see it's only cover 120 square feet. So you're going to need a lot of this to cover, like a 25,000 square foot floor plate. Next slide. If you look at UV light in these 10 studies, we what we see is mainly induct or behind the coil. So it's about $1.3 per CFM, slightly cheaper than the portable air cleaner, but more expensive than the filter. And it's about $1.3 per square foot too. Next slide. 
So what we just look at is the first call. So we see that the filter can be a very effective way to get a high level of cleaning, but relatively inexpensive first cause. In the operating cost is also, if you look at the outside air, now this is three buildings, it's in New York State. And then if you look at the increase in outside air, once you increase the outside air, it's gonna increase the running cost quite significantly. In building three is about 0.1 per square foot. In building two is about 0.3. Building one is more expensive because they do like actually two hours flushing is before some of the latest guidance per weight um, presentation. You can really do like the free air changes of flushing by less than 30 minutes in most of the commercial building if you have a VAB system. So it's actually quite expensive to run outside air. Next slide. But if you just focus on filter, the operating cost of a MERV 13 filter, in this case, compared to MERV 5, is actually doesn't quite increase the static pressure loss, at least if you, if you pick the right filter. So it doesn't mean that use MERV, MERV 13 filter is gonna increase your running cost significantly. Next slide. So the takeaway here so far on first and operating cost is basically if you have good outside air, good filter. It could be not expensive first cost and maybe minimal, if any at all, increase in operating cost if you use just MER 13 filter. But you have to address the risk. Let's look at the risk. Next slide. In fact, actually workplace risk, this is a study from Germany and you can see orange is the workplace outbreak. Now workplace, they, they do in, include more than office buildings. But you can see compared to private homes, you, <laughs> chances are you, you are probably safer at work because a lot of the cases happen at private room and definitely elderly living care facilities. Next slide. Or in this Michigan study, it include a lot of the outside of the residential places. You see school, you see um, this assistant living, they have very high outbreaks. There are some outbreaks in the office setting, but not as significant as those building spaces. Next slide. So some people worry about elevator, but actually the elevator risk is actually really low, as you can see on this slide here, because if you look at a high rise elevator like New York City, usually they have about 70 plus air changes per hour compared to like about six air change in the office building. Next slide. So we did our own study. This is a Wells Riley model and we figure out the risk of an elevator is actually really low. Next slide. It's about 0.005% with mass. Now compared to if you use a ionizer 90% decay, it would take 5.5 minutes inside the elevator compared to just turn on the exhaust fan, right? So using ionizer, you know, the, the duration to get to 50 a 90 percent decays is much longer than the elevator ride itself. Next slide. So finally we're gonna run through okay if we do the minimal outside air with high MER filter, what type of risk are we looking at? This is our office building in New York State. Next slide. So first case we look at is, uh, next slide. So those are the assumptions, you can go through that later. So next slide. So the first case here, the blue is the is a space that with no mass, 100% occupancy rate is gonna be about 1%, next slide. But, next slide. Next slide. So once you put in the MERV 13 filter or outside air, now remember outside air is a lot more expensive to do, but MERV 13 filter is actually very close to the performance of the outside air. And, and the risk is significantly lower already, right? Still no mass, next slide. Now you with mass, the risk is significantly lower. Now none of these people are vaccinated. So you can just imagine in a vaccinated environment is even lower than this, next slide. And if you decrease the density by just 50% 50, 50 
you roughly get about 50% 50, 50 reduction in the risk level to about 0.6%. Next slide. Finally, this is the one with the density and wear mask. So with the 50% lower density and people all wear masks is the last columns, the those, those, those three columns here. And those are still unvaccinated. So if you are vaccinated wearing masks, your risk inside the office is low, especially if you decrease the density by 50%. Next slide. So with that, the summary here is, there are ways we can minimize the risk without putting in a lot of energy costs. In fact, if you put in a MER 13 filter, potentially you have minimal, if any, cost increase on the operation side, but you can get to a level of performance as a good baseline but you have to mind of the risk level you are running into. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bill, Wade, and Luke for that great overview. And uh, really for all that you and your colleagues at ASHRAE and on the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force have done to compile that body of critical information and to share it with businesses and institutions that needed to operate more safely uh, during the ongoing pandemic. Um, so this concludes the presentation portion of our event for today. Um, with the uh, remaining eight minutes or so, uh, I'd like to open things up for the final Q&A session with our presenters. Um, we've got a lot of fantastic questions from the audience over the course of the presentation. Um, and I'd like to encourage you to keep uh, your questions coming and we'll answer as many as we have time for. Um, and with that, I'd like to actually ask the first question um, to Wade uh, on the epidemic task force. So Wade, um, question is, uh, what is the best engineering control or mitigation strategy to implement? Uh, the shortest answer is it depends. It depends on the HVAC <laughs> system you have in your space and how it's been uh, cr created. And there are so many different varieties, and that's why you have to analyze each system with each space as a whole. So we can move on and do, due to time, but it depends. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, we just got one in that says, how does risk analysis for office buildings look if there is an infector in the space, not based on percentage of population infected? I think I'm going to kick that over to the epidemic task force. Do you guys have a, have a perspective on that? Well, I wonder if Luke wants to say something since his, his examples in, sure. took into consideration the population. So, yeah, so. the, the Wales Wells Riley calculate does take into the the percentage of the population is actually getting infected as a probability inside the space. So you if you had three percent, you, you might have less than one infector assumed, and the, the risk would be higher if you actually put someone in the space. And of course, that's one of the issues that I was raising about it being hard to, to decide exactly what the right level of mitigation is because there are so many different definitions of what acceptable risk is. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, okay. Um, uh, Bill, well I've, well, I've got you on the camera. Uh, next one's for you. Um, so uh, the question is, what is the basis for the Harvard Colorado 5-6 EACH recommendation? And I hope I, I hope I articulated that properly. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean that that's a, an important question because the, that uh, recommendation is so widely uh, circulated. And actually, if you get uh, Joe Allen's article that he co-authored on air changes uh, fairly recently, what it says is, well, five to six air changes per hour is in the range of uh, equivalent air changes that we see in healthcare facilities. So it, it's explicitly not a COVID risk assessment based number, but it uh, it is, I think, appropriate given what we know about uh, healthcare infection control. And, and that raises the further question of, well, should we be changing recommendations because of, of different variants? And I, I think my answer to that would, would be that there's enough uncertainty in how much risk there is and in what any given measure does that I, I think if you're at a good level of exposure reduction, there's no particular reason to change it. Just be careful to apply as many layers of control as you can. That makes a ton of sense. Um, all right, so uh, we're, we're getting a little thin on time. I'm gonna ask one more question. This one's actually kind of a fun one to, uh, to end things on. 
um, because it's, it's sort of broad brush, um, but I'm, I'm going to kick this out to really the entire team and anybody who wants to jump in. Um, and the question is, how might HVAC system design change as a result of the pandemic? I'm going to I'm going to hit on to a practical item that I'm, I was actually had conversations about right and it's at VAV boxes of people modifying VAV and fan powered boxes to have not only to not only be able to do MERV 8s, but to have a, a, a separate to have a, a deeper MERV 13. So during pandemic, they can go to that. So they're actually modifying it. And then others that were saying that they're switching back to fan powered boxes, which have kind of come out of uh, of use just so that they can guarantee the airflow. But I'm sure Luke and Bill have others. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Wade. The filter will be a very good place to start to at, at least have a MERV 13 filter. But I mean, there's an also another dimension that the industry start looking at is the airflow pattern in, inside the space. More to come about that. We're definitely working with a few organizations to try to figure out the exterior zone, what happened when you have minimal outside air or, you know, roughly about six air change in the summer, what's the airflow pattern inside a space is and how we're going to arrange or potentially move, move around, a, you know, set up this furniture the way differently to, to facilitate more air, more air movement inside a space. Yeah, I, I'd hope that um, at least MERV 13 would become a standard filter efficiency. And, and I think we need to look at particulate levels in uh, building types that don't have uh, air recirculation. So if you have a DOAS system with radiant panels, where's the control for indoor PM in, in that system? Uh, I think that, that we need to address that as well. And the other thing is I think, uh, better demand control ventilation. So more, more localized and capable of providing better IEQ, but saving a lot of energy where the people aren't in a building. We know that's been an issue during the pandemic. Okay. Well, thank you gentlemen for that response. Uh, we got about two minutes uh, remaining. So uh, that concludes our webinar for the day. Um, if you'd like a copy of this presentation or a recording of the event, um, if you have any further questions on the content that's been provided, or if you'd like to connect with NYSERDA directly to find more about the resources and the information showcased today, please don't hesitate to reach out to me directly uh, at Joe Berman at NYSERDA.ny.gov or go to NYSERDA.ny.gov backslash FlexTech and you should find pretty much everything that you need there. Um, and with that, on behalf of NYSERDA and our colleagues at ASHRAE, I want to thank you for joining us for this presentation. We're very grateful for the time that you spent with us today and hope that you've gotten information that will be valuable and beneficial to your organization. We look forward to seeing you again uh, at future events, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, in the near term um, and in the interim. Um, be well, be safe, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, Jim.